Today is a lecture on development economics. And uh, development is interested in how we can increase the, the well being of those who most need it. So it's probably the most important field uh, in economics. Um, and you'll see uh, there aren't many Nobel Prizes uh, in this field. So I have complemented uh, the Nobel Prizes by uh, Leontief Prizes. So Leontief Prize, again, is a prize that rewards outstanding contributions uh, to research that uh, fosters or studies uh, just and sustainable societies. And uh, you will see also uh, many women economists uh, during this session. Uh, so perhaps it's no, not uh, a coincidence that uh, women chose this uh, subject of vital importance. So before digging into the theories and the result of development economics, I'm going to question what we mean by development and uh, give some descriptive statistics uh, to give some reasons why we need development in the first place. So here is a map of the world uh, that is area preserving. So the area of the country on the map is proportional to the true area of this country. This is a map where the area of, on the map is deformed so that it's proportional to the population of the country. Of course, China and India are much bigger than the others. And here is a map deformed uh, where area is in proportion to GDP in 2004. So actually, the size of China will be a bit bigger. But you've seen that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has almost entirely disappeared from the map. Um, now, this is a, a graph that shows uh, the per capita GDP of uh, different countries or regions across time. And uh, if we take some line like uh, here at uh, $100 per month or $1,200 per year, this is in uh, purchasing uh, power parity to be comparable across regions and across time. You see that the level of, of income You see that the average, the average level of income today in some sub-Saharan countries uh, is um, corresponds to the level of income of uh, China and India in the 70s, corresponds to uh, the world average at the end of the 19th century, and uh, was already attained by the UK in uh, the 18th century. Uh, you, it on this graph, but uh, yeah. So um, some countries are beyond others by by uh, uh, one century or more, if uh, we think in terms of uh, consumption per capita. Just uh, think before I show the next graph. Uh, what do you think is the share of people in the world that live with less than three dollars per day? And and think also the share of people living with less than $1.9 dollars per day, which is considered the extreme poverty line. So below uh, this, this poverty line, uh, people are, have not enough resources to, to, to eat well enough to, to, be, uh, to meet their basic needs. So the answer, at least according to this data, which is a bit pessimistic, uh, is that about half of uh, the world population lives below uh, $3 per day. And uh, about one-tenth, so about 700 million, live below uh, $1.9 uh, per day. Sorry, I, I said three, I meant 5.5, .5. mistake for me. Uh, half of the people, according to this data, live below $5.5 .5 per day. And there are many countries where the share of people in extreme poverty, so below this uh, extreme poverty line, 
uh, is very high. Uh, it's the majority of the population in some uh, sub-Saharan countries. Uh, it's between uh, 30 and 50% in, uh, in, in South Asia. And it's virtually zero uh, in, uh, in the North, including uh, in China. On this graph, you see the evolution of the number of people living in extreme poverty. So this number has reduced tremendously in the last three decades. We are here currently. And this reduction is entirely driven by what happened in China and East Asia, Asia and to a lesser extent in South Asia. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of people in extreme poverty has actually increased in the last 30 years. So the proportion of people has decreased in Sub-Saharan Africa, but because of population growth, the absolute numbers haven't decreased. And according to the World Bank, they should not decrease in the, in the next 20 years. In South Asia, it is decreasing because India experiences uh, high growth levels. Now, another measure that is more accurate of poverty than the number of people below the poverty line is the poverty gap. So the poverty gap of one poor person is uh, the distance from the income to that person to the poverty line. And the poverty gap of a country is the sum of the poverty gap of each uh, poor people in this country. So let's say that uh, the poverty line is uh, $1,000 per year, and uh, your income is $600. Your personal poverty gap is $400. This is what it would cost to uh, reach uh, the, the poverty line. And now if um, there is uh, 1 million people in the country, and they are all at $600, then uh, the poverty gap of the country is $400 million. Okay. This is the, an estimate of the global poverty gap, $160 billion per year. So this is... Uh, a crude approximation of the costs uh, to end extreme poverty. It's a crude approximation because uh, perhaps ending uh, extreme poverty would be cheaper because uh, providing uh, some uh, capital or income to poor people would uh, uh, entail self-sustained growth. So we wouldn't need to, to give them uh, uh, all the, 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 the poverty gap to to make them grow richer, or maybe uh, the amount needed is, is more because there are some leakage in the way, because uh, uh, when we give people to people, they will work less. So there are different effects, but Jeffrey Sachs uh, finds that um, the global poverty gap is actually a good proxy because uh, we're doing more sophisticated computation, he finds that to end poverty, an end of around $60 per person and per year would have to flow to the poorest country, which is in line with uh, this figure of $160 billion per year. Now to put this number yeah, in perspective, we have to think, are the low-income countries able to uh, fill this gap? and with internal redistribution? The answer is no. Uh, a paper by Block and co-authors uh, that will soon be published showed that 62 countries do not have the resources to close their poverty gap. Even, I mean, the, the way they do the computation is thinking that all people in a country that earn more than $30 per day the government would tax any income of these people in excess of $13 per day and redistribute it to those earning less than $1.9 per day. It's a hypothetical policy, of course, 
Um, and uh, the threshold of uh, $13 per day corresponds to the poverty line in the US, so in a, one of the highest income country. So the, the, the idea is like, if you take all income uh, of people uh, that are not poor according to US standards, um, in excess of this poverty line, and you give it to uh, people of the same country below the extreme poverty line, you have enough resources to, to fill the poverty gap. The answer is no in 62 countries. Yes? Um, aside from income, doesn't it also depend on the capabilities um, in the poor countries or strength of institutions and that kind of thing? The question is, uh, is income a good measure for poverty? Um, you're right, uh, we should take other things into account, capabilities, um, I will, uh, I will talk about uh, some other measures uh, in the next slides. Uh, income is, uh, is the first proxy. Uh, and then to put this number, so, so low-income countries do not have the resources by themselves to, to end poverty. Uh, that's the bottom line. And, uh, but this figure, $160 billion, uh, it is quite small. Uh, if we think of uh, the global income or global wealth. Jeffrey Sachs computes that an additional uh, tax of 5% uh, only in the US on uh, people earning more than $200,000 per year, an additional tax on their income above uh, $200,000 per year by 5% would yield enough revenues to uh, end poverty at the global level. But the US have other priorities. Uh, military spending is almost uh, 30 times higher than foreign aid in the US. Another way to, to, to think about this number is um, to think what would happen uh, if we target the richest people in the world. Think about the 90 billionaires that are richer than uh, $20 billion, all their wealth in excess of these 20 billions, if we expropriate it, and with the dividend, assuming 7% uh, return per year, the dividend alone would be uh, enough to close the global poverty gap. Uh, we can also uh, compare this to uh, the GDP of Switzerland, which is $750 billion. So if uh, Swiss people would be ready to, to reduce their income by 20%, it would be enough to uh, close the global poverty gap. This, uh, I mean, the global GDP is uh, $100 trillion. So this number, $160 billion, it's 0.3% of the GDP of OECD countries. Another uh, statistic is that it corresponds to the profit of Microsoft, Apple, and Google in a year. Um, yes. Now, we've concentrated on extreme poverty. Let's look at the whole distribution of income. This is the global distribution of income in 1988. Before that, we don't have uh, good data. And you see it's bimodal. You have uh, low-income countries on one side uh, whose distribution of income almost doesn't overlap with uh, that of high-income countries. And then as it evolves over time and uh, China grows, um, then uh, it evolves towards a unimodal distributions. The distribution of income in sub-Saharan countries in orange, uh, again, does not uh, overlap a lot with uh, the distribution of income in uh, North America or Europe. But uh, incomes in, uh, in China uh, do, and to a lesser extent, in South Asia. So the global average income in purchasing power parity uh, is $2,000 per month. This is uh, data from uh, last week uh, from the World Inequality Report 2022, which I recommend. It's uh, very interesting. Um, this uh, report 
shows that uh, the top 1% owns a share 20% of all income in the world, and their average income is $40,000 per month. I think the, the threshold to, to be in the top 1% is, uh, is, is uh, $20,000 uh, per month. So the top 1% has a share of 20% 20, 20 of all incomes. The top 10% has a share 52% of all incomes. Then the next 40% as a share, 40% of all income, and the bottom 50%, the bottom half, as a share, 8% of all income. So if you take top 10, next 40, bottom 50, the shares are 50, 40, 10, roughly. The average income in the bottom 50% is $325 per month. And uh, in the top 10%, the average is $10,000 per month. Sorry, what's the main point of the PPP income? PPP uh, income means that um, the true, I mean, at the real, ex at the market exchange rate, uh, the um, income of uh, people in the bottom 50% uh, is actually lower because they live in low-income countries where goods are cheaper. The idea is that if you live in Colombia with $2,000 uh, per month, you are rich enough to, to have a maid, you know. Uh, if you live uh, in Switzerland with $2,000 per month, you can barely uh, pay your rent. And so um, PPP adjusts. And, uh, and two thousand dollars per month in Colombia would correspond to I don't know six thousand in uh, Switzerland. Something like that. Um, and, and actually, it would overlap less between uh, between India or China and Europe if we looked at market exchange rate. So yeah. So people uh, so so. The higher middle class in India, they, they can afford uh, having domestic maids, but maybe not flying, whereas in Europe it's the country. So it's a, it's a rough adjustment. So what this figure shows is that if we cut, if we could cut by half uh, the income of the top 1% from 40k per month to 20k per month and redistribute it to the bottom 50%, we could more than double the income of the bottom 20% to more than $700 per month. This is a famous curve by Lechner and um, Christopher Lechner and Ranko Milanovic. Ranko Milanovic is a uh, have price, which is called the elephant curve. It shows who captured global growth in income in the last decade, so between 88 and 2008. So on the x-axis, you have the percentile, percentile in the global income distribution, so from the poorest to the richest. And on the y-axis, by how much their income has grown in these 30 years. So you see that. Uh, for the poorest, it has grown a little. This is uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Then for people around the median, this is uh, China, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, it has grown a lot. Then in the eighth or seventh, eighth, ninth uh, decile, uh, it has almost no, not grown. And these guys here are the Western working class. And for the top 1%, it has also grown a lot. And uh, yes, and you, can, you can see on this side of the graph uh, some political issues we have in Western countries uh, where maybe the, the anti-elite uh, sentiment is justified because the elite captured 
all the growth in these countries. Yes? Why is it so low in the 80th percentile? Why is it so low in the 80th uh, percentile? Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. The question is why hasn't the, the income of um, the redneck in the US grown uh, in these 30 years? Um, why uh, the US GDP has grown by 3% per year, 2%? There are different answers. Uh, first is uh, the policies that uh, were advantageous to uh, the, the tax policies that, that did not help uh, these people, or the minimum wage policies that didn't help. Um, there may be an effect of automatization and uh, globalization that has made uh, these workers um, less competitive. And uh, what we observe in the last uh, 30, 40 years is uh, very high growth in uh, wages of uh, top wages, uh, doctors, uh, computer scientists, etc. Uh, so it's deba debated whether uh, it's, it's natural outcome of uh, um, the automatization or whether it's due to policies or yeah. the erosion of the middle class in the rich countries. Yes, it's the erosion of the middle class in the rich countries, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, which countries are at the right? Is the very right? It's... Uh, no, uh, 99%. Here? Yeah, yeah. So actually, the, I think the, the last percentile is more diverse in terms of countries than uh, the last decile. Uh, because of the very high inequality in like China, so you have quite a lot of people in China that are very rich, uh, but, but uh, overall, it's mostly American people that are here. Also because the US is more unequal than Europe. So the US is more rich and more unequal than Europe. So you have more American here than European, and you have almost no African or Indian. Yes. Uh, this is before the crisis. How has it changed since? It's a good question. I think um, I think it is uh, it is less uh, less um, pronounced than this since the crisis. There is the updated graph in the World Inequality Report. Now, uh, yes. Because it looks like an elephant. Yes, <laughs> this is the truth. <laughs> Um, now, let's turn to other measures of uh, deprivation. This is the, um, so in blue, the number of people that are undernourished, and in orange, the share of uh, people in the world population that are undernourished. Undernourished means that uh, you don't have enough um, nutrients or calories in your uh, daily food. And uh, you've seen that uh, in the last years it has stagnated, and due to the COVID crisis, it has increased to uh, 770 million people that are left lacking sufficient food. It's about 10% of the global population. This is the maternal mortality ratio. So the share of uh, pregnancy that ends up in the death of the pregnant woman. It's almost zero uh, in Western countries, in China. The world average is uh, 200 people, 200 deaths uh, for 100,000 births. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's decreasing, but at 600, it's at the same level as at the beginning of the 20th century in the US. And this is the average over sub-Saharan countries. But you have countries where it's higher, and within these countries, you have villages where it's uh, even higher. You have villages where it's extremely risky to, to be pregnant. Uh, if, and this is per birth. So if you take uh, the, the probability that a woman uh, dies in pregnancy, it's uh, often more than 1% uh, over her, li her lifetime. This is the child mortality rate. So the percentage of children who die before reaching the age five. 
We see that in India, it's about 5%. Uh, in sub-Saharan sub countries, it's about 10%, um, which corresponds to, uh, to uh, some, uh, I mean, which is higher than the most developed countries uh, in uh, the 50s. So this number is decreasing. You can see the number of uh, children dying before five. And the, in orange, the preferred projection of the United Nations is decreasing less rapidly than uh, it was at a comparable stage of development in the US or in Western Europe and is decreasing less rapidly uh, even than the objective of the Sustainable Development Goal. Now this is the average years of schooling. So from uh, the first year of school, Jerry at uh, six years old, until uh, the, the last year. So for you, it will be uh, the last year of master or doctorate. So in Ethiopia, it's uh, three years. In India, China, between six and eight years. And in Switzerland, it's uh, 13 years. And you see that uh, even though uh, China has invested a lot in uh, education, it's still at the level of uh, the US and Switzerland uh, before the Second World War. So education is uh, very important for the development of a country. But actually, in Africa, uh, even though we could think uh, the lack of education is a big issue, there are other issues. Uh, there are a lot of people that have uh, a degree, uh, sometimes a degree in physics, in engineering, and who can't find a job. So it's not the only problem, at least in Africa. This is the literacy rate by age group. So teenagers are almost all literate in uh, all of the world, uh, except Sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, there is just a bunch of uh, countries inside where the literacy rate is uh, below 60%. And there is a stark uh, generational divide. So in many countries, in the Middle East, in India, in North Africa, uh, the young people uh, can read, um, can uh, write, but uh, not their grandparents. And uh, I mean, this may be a, a reason uh, for the Arab Spring, uh, you know, the political movements in, in North uh, Africa and the Middle East, because people who are literate uh, have more tools to, to criticize their regime and, and rebel. And now uh, life expectancy, it's increasing everywhere. There is a, a kind of constant over time gap of about uh, 20 years uh, between uh, Switzerland and Africa. And uh, you see that uh, life expectancy in China is almost as high as in uh, Europe and the US. Yes? For the green line, I don't, I can figure which country is it, but why is it fluctuates uh, in not after 1940? Is so, so you have two green lines. Uh, this, this one that fluctuates a lot is Japan. The figure? Yeah, because a lot of people died during the Second World War. Oh, okay, I see. And, uh, and China is the Second World War. Okay. Yeah, you have also, uh, is it, which one is it? The, the, in Russia, uh, it, it decreased, the, no, in, uh, yeah, in Russia, it uh, decreased a lot during the First uh, World War. You see in Russia that uh, life expectancy has decreased after the fall of the Soviet Union and, uh, and has stagnated for 30 years. Now it's, it's uh, rebounding again. 
will be in the COVID pandemic, I'm not sure. And uh, the last indicator, which is a very good indicator of uh, the level of development of a country, is the share of the labor force employed in agriculture. Uh, it's, it's perhaps a better indicator than income or, or others because it's, it's less, uh, it's more comparable across uh, periods, across uh, countries. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's uh, about half of the population. In South Asia, about 40%. In China, 25%, and in the most developed countries, it's below 3%. Are there questions on this data? Yes. Like a proxy for the extent of automation or you know, technical advancement. It's a um, it's a proxy of uh, yes of tech, of uh, productivity in agriculture and industrialization and urbanization, which are all associated with development. Now, what is the goal of development, and what is the meaning of development? The concept of development emerged quite late in the forties, according to uh, an historian of economic development, uh, Arndt. And the concept emerged as a growth in pro capita income, growth in GDP. And this concept originated in the US and in the UK as um, some, some, some guy, I remember, I don't remember his name, uh, proposed a, a global program for development. And uh, this was uh, taken up by uh, the US government to justify the, the war and to, to show to the world, to propose to the world a bright future uh, after the war, to motivate the troops that the future would be better if the allies win the war, and also to motivate people in the colonies uh, that were enrolled in the army. And after the war, um, in his inaugural speech, uh, President uh, Harry Truman offered technical assistance to uh, low developed countries. It is often uh, dated as the birth of uh, the idea of development. But uh, it's a double edged sword because, okay, he proposed the offer to help uh, low income countries, but uh, he said pretty explicitly that uh, he was offering technical assistance instead of direct transfers because uh, it was uh, cheaper than direct transfers and more profitable to US firms. But at the same time, the World Bank was created with the goal to lend capital to uh, countries in dire need of capital. Because in countries like China or India, uh, after the Second World War, the only way to have accumulation, uh, capital accumulation on their own would be to really starve their population because their income was so low that to have uh, some savings, they, would, they, they, they need to, to shed consumption to intolerable levels. And so the idea of the World Bank was to lend the needed capital to this country, they would grow and repay it a few years after. Uh, it was both uh, benevolent action for the development of, of humanity and also uh, to avoid uh, the spread of communism. And then um, a few years later, in uh, the end of the 60s and the 70s, the emphasis uh, shifted in Western countries. Uh, the goal ceased to be uh, growth in GDP and became uh, meeting the basic need of population, eliminating poverty. This coincided with uh, growing criticism in the West of the Western model of mass consumption that uh, was uh, beginning to be seen as unsustainable uh, environmentally and, uh, and perhaps uh, not uh, directly applicable in other countries, not uh, generalizable to, to the whole earth because of, uh, of resource constraints. And, um, 
this new emphasis towards basic needs uh, was met with skepticism uh, with, uh, with people in, in low-income countries uh, because when development economists uh, told them, you know, you should uh, not try to suppress the informal sector, uh, uh, forget about uh, catching up with the West and, uh, and, and build a very modern economy like us, uh, just uh, focus on uh, feeding uh, your population and bringing healthcare. Uh, some uh, people felt that uh, it was a way to, to maintain them uh, below the West and, uh, and, and, and they wanted uh, full industrialization. Uh, the Leontief Prize, Paul Stritten, um, makes the case for this basic needs approach uh, in his book, First Things First. And he argues uh, in particular that the basic needs should be defined by the population themselves in a democratic process. This is to uh, counter um, criticism of uh, development that uh, accused the uh, development of uh, a and like an imperialistic uh, idea from the West. Because as soon as uh, we, we talk about development, it puts uh, different countries into hierarchy and uh, it says to like half of the world, you are underdeveloped. And uh, it says to them, uh, the model you should follow is the Western model of modernization. And uh, you should not seek uh, the solution to, to, to your problems, uh, the future of your society in your own traditions, uh, in your own ideas, but you should look uh, to what we are doing in the West. And so uh, Stritten um, took up the, the criticism and said, uh, no, so let's ask the population themselves and not the elite in these countries what they want. And it will probably coincide with uh, meeting the basic needs, actually. And uh, development has multiple facets. Uh, it's not always not only uh, growth in GDP, it's not only meeting the basic needs. And this can be seen in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 development goals. Uh, each of them uh, has several targets, and these are uh, as many objectives of development. We can uh, regroup these different facets into three uh, strands. The first is economy-centered, so growth in GDP per capita, uh, full employment, industrialization. The second is diplomacy-centered, here, the, the, the willingness to catch up with uh, developed countries, uh, the catch up that the country uh, becomes powerful, uh, wealthy, has a high status. And then there are some uh, spiritual uh, centered motives, uh, the idea to be self-sufficient, um, the, um, the idea of emancipation, and uh, um, the Mahatma Gandhi, for example, uh, supported uh, self-sufficiency uh, as the idea of development, uh, that uh, each Indian village uh, should be reliant uh, on their selves and, uh, and, and organize uh, themselves uh, to, to have uh, a shared prosperity uh, among their peers. Uh, but in India, it's the, the view of uh, Nehru uh, who won. Uh, Nehru became the, the first prime minister of uh, India, and his view was to, to industrialize uh, India. Um, then Francis T. Watt studies the interrelation between economic growth and human development. This other uh, uh, facets. And she argues that uh, both reinforce each other. She runs cross country regressions. So she regresses uh, economic growth uh, over the characteristics of uh, different countries across time. And she also regresses human development over these characteristics. And here's what she finds cross country regressions show a significant relationship in both directions 
with public expenditures on health and education, notably female, especially important in the chain from economic growth to human development. So the idea is that uh, economic growth causes uh, human development. And the investment rate and income distribution significant in the human development to economic growth chain. Causality runs both ways. Then she says that uh, it can become a virtuous cycle or vicious cycle, and that uh, it has more chances to become a virtuous cycle when the emphasis is put on human development first. So she concludes that where choice is necessary, human development should be given sequencing priority. And uh, so the term of development is often uh, equated for economic growth in low-income countries. And uh, for the same thing in high-income countries, we would just talk about growth. But can we think of an, another meaning of development in uh, high-income countries? As early as uh, 1870, uh, John Stuart Mill argued that uh, in the most developed countries, so in UK and the US, um, more economic growth was not needed. What was needed in these countries was more redistribution. And uh, G.H. Shaw uh, studies in the US, uh, the way people work, the way people live, and in her book, Plenitude, she envisions a way towards true wealth. She argues that American people work too much. And because they, they feel deprived when they don't have uh, so, so much time for leisure, for social relationship, uh, they turn to consumption to reward themselves. And then they consume too much. They also consume to keep up with the Joneses, that the Americans say. Uh, meaning for the social status of consumption. You know, your neighbor just bought a Tesla, you want to work hard to be able to buy a Tesla yourself. And uh, this is a zero-sum game because, uh, of course, if uh, your neighbor buys a Tesla, he's happy because you are unhappy, and you are unhappy because he's richer. And um, she explains uh, this uh, increasing race uh, of status seeking, the race for status. Uh, she argues that it explains declining saving rates in the US. People don't save enough for retirement because they, they have to uh, outconsume uh, their neighbors, their peers. So she argues in favor of um, uh, to, to take productivity increases in the form of more leisure time rather than increased output. So the idea is she, she pushes for the reduction in the number of hours worked. She argues that it would make people happier in, uh, in high income countries. And, uh, and this is a path to, to deal with. Another question be before I jump to the theories. Yes. Uh, what's the difference between uh, economic growth and economic development. And human development. So economic growth can be unequal. Uh, it can be captured by, uh, by the top 1%. And human development is, uh, is several factors, but it's uh, the level of education, it's the level of, uh, of health, and uh, the level of inequality. So you can have uh, economic growth of the elites without uh, human development. You can have human development with very little economic growth. Yes. Nowadays, uh, African countries receive more financial assistance or technolo technological uh, assistance from uh, like Western countries. More than, more than what? More financial assistance. Or more than, more than what? Technological. Assistance so more than more than in the past, more more than uh, yeah, more than in the past. Because I think it's a um, this is more important. So the level I don't I, it depends uh, when you what is the past, but I, I know that in the last uh, you have to to look it up. But, uh, well, I 
think that in the last 30, 40 years, uh, the um, high-income countries give in foreign, in foreign aid about 0.3, uh, 0.4 percent of their GDP. So it has increased because their GDP has increased, but it has not increased a lot. And uh, they promised in 1970 to give 0.7 percent of their GDP in foreign aid. And only like uh, three or four countries uh, respect this uh, this promise. Uh, it's like uh, the UK and some Scandinavian countries. So, um, so there is a debate whether uh, foreign aid is, is useful. Or not. There is another issue with foreign aid is that um, it's 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 not uh, designed to really help uh, the the. the the lowest income countries. Uh, it's often done uh, in a way um, as, a, as a bargaining um, tool for high income countries, uh, for example, to have uh, low income countries uh, accept uh, treaties or vote in this thing they want to vote uh, at the United Nations or um, or it serves the, their own interest because uh, there are conditions that uh, we give you for an aid if uh, uh, you build this road uh, towards the uranium mine or something like that. So, so the, the, with the, the, the same amount of foreign aid, we could actually uh, probably end uh, extreme poverty. So there are two issues. The, the first is that uh, foreign aid is, uh, is not uh, done in a benevolent way. It's interested. And the second is that it's too low. It's, it's also, uh, I mean, Jeffrey Sachs, for example, argues that it's too low. And, uh, and some argue that um, the issue why uh, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa doesn't develop is uh, corruption. Here again, there is a debate. Of course, uh, we need to fight corruption. But uh, Jeffrey Sachs or Hajun Chang that we'll see, they argue that the level of corruption in Sub-Saharan Africa is not higher than the level of corruption uh, in uh, the US or in Europe in the 19th century, like at comparable stages of development. Uh, actually, institutions are, in Africa are probably um, more advanced than, uh, than, than that of uh, Western uh, countries at the similar stages of development. And, uh, and Sachs says that the, the true reasons for, uh, for poverty in Africa is rather that uh, they have a disease burden, uh, malaria in particular. Uh, they have, it, there are some diseases that uh, that spread with the heat in the, the tropics. Um, they, they have uh, an issue of transportation costs because Africa is so wide. Uh, transportation is costly. And the most important is uh, poor agricultural productivity. And uh, this is a problem in all tropical countries. The soil are poor, are not so productive. Uh, the absence of winter is actually bad because in the winter helps killing the pest. Uh, and in Africa, there, there are many places where you don't have a big uh, river uh, to be used for irrigation, like in India. Or... So, um, so the amount of if the, the amount of foreign aid would, was increased, uh, or the amount of charity donation was increased, uh, uh, poverty could, could probably be reduced. Uh, even though there are yeah, there are people that argue otherwise, but uh, yeah. Welcome. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, people who argue otherwise. It's not really consistent with uh, what we see because we see that uh, some interventions they are effective. Um, so, development economics uh, started with uh, big theories, macroeconomic theories, and uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, with the credibility revolution, uh, these theories have been, have been put into questions. Uh, we've seen the limitations of these theories, and uh, now the, the new trend in economic de in development economics is to run uh, experiments or or do empirical work uh, to see in special cases what works, what doesn't work. Because overall, the big theories 
they often fail. They, they, they don't apply everywhere. Um, but they, they still play uh, an important role and uh, they are still true to a large extent. So I will present uh, some of them. The most famous one is by Arthur Lewis. Lewis. So a Nobel Prize, first Nobel Prize uh, in Development Economics. Also the only uh, black Nobel Prize. It comes from uh, the Barbad, I think, uh, like uh, from the Antillas. And um, he is famous for his model that um, shows that, that features two sectors in the society, the subsistence agricultural sector and the industrial urban sector. The idea is that the subsistence sector has excess labor. This is for two reasons. First is that there has been a recent progress in the country um, in agricultural productivity and uh, demographic growth. And so there are many people in the countryside that are unproductive because uh, we don't really need them to on the fields. There, there is enough uh, people already. So this benefits the manufacturing sector uh, in the cities because uh, it provides an almost a limited labor supply. So you don't have to increase wages to attract more workers. So the capitalist can pay low wages and reinvest the profits, um, which leads to capital accumulation and infinite development. Here you see uh, where the model can fail if uh, either um, wages increase because uh, workers organize and uh, ask for uh, higher wages instead of uh, reinvesting the profits, or because the capitalists don't reinvest the profits, but rather uh, put them in a, bank, in a bank account in Switzerland, uh, speculate uh, by unproductive assets, uh, et cetera, or consume. But uh, if it works well, here is the causal chain. And uh, this is self-sustained growth until the Lewisian turning point. This turning point is well, there is, when there is no, uh, when the, the excess labor is exhausted in the agricultural sector. At this stage, um, the productivity of, uh, of a worker is the same uh, in the agricultural sector and in the in manufacturing sector. Uh, the the um, marginal productivity in the in the agricultural sector is not uh, below the average productivity as uh, before the turning point, and uh, we are more or less at the Lewisian turning point in China right now, uh, meaning that uh, there is a uh, I mean the 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 amount of uh, of, uh, of uh, laborers that can be uh, brought from the countryside is almost exhausted. So at this stage, farmers start being paid at their marginal productivity, not above, and wages are equalized in both sectors. So capitalists have to raise wages to attract more laborers. This hampers uh, capital accumulation. So this is the, the end of very rapid growth. So the reality often doesn't work like the Lewis model. Uh, as I said, uh, capital accumulation uh, need not be uh, natural consequences of uh, what precedes. And another issue is that uh, population growth uh, can result in increasing unemployment instead of uh, increasing manufacturing production. So if the production grows more rapidly than, uh, than capital, than, uh, than the manufacturing sector, uh, then the engine, engine of growth is broken. So this is the, the most famous uh, work with Lewis, but uh, there is a very interesting paper um, 
which is entitled The Diffusion of Development, where he talks about different things. And uh, he asked what um, development uh, policy tropical countries uh, should uh, aim for. It's in 76. And um, he proposes two big uh, options. The first one is to develop through trade. So uh, the, the countries would uh, trade uh, raw materials, agricultural products, um, metals, and use the revenues to invest in capital accumulation. And the other is to copy industrialized countries by um, the way they developed. Uh, and this way uh, is to have more productivity in the agricultural sector and uh, innovation in the manufacturing sector. And so to try to industrialize and uh, make the agricultural production more productive. Because what allowed the industrial revolution in, in England, in Europe, was agricultural productivity gains. It freed up a labor surplus uh, that uh, was used uh, to, to feed the manufacturer, as in the Lewis model. The problem uh, with the option of trade is that the tropics face defavorable terms of trade. Terms of trade is um, the price they obtain for what they sell. It's defavorable because they obtain a, a lower price for one hour of work than uh, the same kind of work in uh, high income countries. Lewis takes the example of uh, cashew nuts in, I uh, don't remember the, the African countries, maybe in Cameroon, and uh, versus uh, wool in New Zealand. Uh, it's, it's something, wool, it's, it's something you cannot produce uh, in many places, only in cold places, uh, you can have sheep. And, and cushion nuts is the same, it's only in tropics that you can uh, produce this type of crops. And uh, in the same time of, of work, you know, it's uh, manual labor, uh, it's not highly mechanized. So in theory, uh, why would the, the, the wage, the hourly wage of a New Zealander be higher than a cab winner? There is no, the reason is that uh, the price of the export is dictated by the opportunity cost of labor in the low productive subsistence sector. So uh, the, the, the cousin of the, the cashew nut, the cashew producer, uh, he works in subsistence agriculture and uh, subsistence agriculture is, is very uh, unproductive in Cameroon and is very productive in New Zealand. And, um, and so the, the wages are equalized uh, in the country. And, uh, and because um, you know, there, there are some countries, some, some um, uh, communities that are traded uh, across the, the world, uh, the, 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 with the, the balasa, it's a kind of reverse balasa simulation effect. This, uh, this effect that uh, the wages in the traded sectors uh, is dictated by the wage in the non traded sector. And uh, the reason why wage do not equalize across country is due to restriction on migration in high income countries like New Zealand. Because, um, and we, we've seen in the 19th century, in the earliest 20th century, and in, that uh, countries like the US or New Zealand um, prevented uh, flows of migration from China or India because uh, voters understood that if they allowed uh, this migration, uh, then the, the immigrants could compete for lower wages and, uh, and they didn't want lower wages. We have uh, arguably the same phenomenon until today. So uh, for this reason, defavorable terms of trade, uh, it's a bad idea to rely on trade to develop, according to, to Lewis. So uh, better to develop manufacturers and agricultures. And with developing agriculture, we will be able to get uh, better terms of trade. And at the end of the paper, so he argues that um, 
there is a kind of dual uh, global playing in uh, high income countries where um, there are insiders and outsiders in the labor market, or how he calls it, people with aristocratic wages and uh, minimum wages. And um, he argues that there is a, a lack of a labor supply for a low wages job, like uh, police, uh, manufacturer, uh, things like that, because um, people are educated uh, and they don't want these jobs. And uh, there are different uh, solutions to, to this problem in the West. The first one would be to equalize wages between the inside the aristocratic uh, people uh, who, who hold the um, executing positions, uh, like engineers or things like that, and, um, and uh, people in uh, workers in manufacture. But uh, of course, uh, uh, the elite doesn't want to, to equalize wages, doesn't want to lose their privilege. And so what the, they favor as a solution is to outsource the production of manufactured goods to uh, middle-income countries uh, like China. Uh, so, um, so, so they, they make the, the so, so they, they, they increase the, the level of, of competition, the, the labor supply um, through external um, com countries. And for Lewis, this is an opportunity for uh, tropical countries. Uh, they should seize it, um, this, this investment in infrastructure from uh, Western countries uh, to industrialize um, and, uh, and start uh, growth. Other questions? So, um, he also uh, mentions in this paper, mm. Uh, a big challenge, that of uh, agriculture. Because he says, as, as population grows, we need to create jobs. And um, for the reason uh, already mentioned, we need to increase productivity in agriculture. But most of the population uh, works in agriculture. And it's probably unrealistic to think that we are being able to create enough jobs in the manufacturing sector. Um, so we need at the same time to create jobs in the agricultural sector and to raise productivity uh, in the agricultural sector. He thinks that it's, it's challenging, but it's, it may be doable by research in, uh, in agronomy and, uh, yeah. To, to find uh, ways of doing agriculture that is uh, suited to the tropics. I'm going to talk about Mick, Michael uh, Lipton, um, Leontief Price, who also uh, emphasized the importance of agriculture and land reform as uh, agricultural policy. So land reform are laws that um, give more control uh, over the land to the poor. Um, so um, to give them more wealth, more higher status, higher income. He shows that uh, land reform are a very good uh, idea because small farms are more productive. So there are different ways, uh, different uh, possible land reforms. But um, one important one is to simply uh, redistribute land. So from a uh, few owners that have uh, big uh, uh, plots, uh, you will give, um, you will divide this, this big plot into s several uh, little plots and give it to uh, farmers without any land. He shows uh, with data analysis that small farms are more productive in uh, low-income countries. So land reform would uh, increase farm output. He says that at least 1.5 billion people today have some farmland as a result of land reform and are less poor or not poor as a result. 
And he, he says that um, the process of land reform is not uh, achieved and that um, it is still needed in many places. Lipton also argues that uh, the rural sector is more efficient than the urban sector. And yet investments are concentrated in uh, urban area due to an urban bias. Poor countries are unlikely to overcome poverty without substantially reducing their reliance on agriculture. However, price twists like investment biases so price twist is the idea that you the, the price of, of food is uh, artificially low um, or investment biases like uh, uh, investment in bias toward industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis agriculture are part of a strategy of instant industrialization that is self-defeating so some countries think like uh, yeah we need to industrialize uh, and ERQ, 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 uh, agree with that but you think that it's uh, counterproductive to, to try and industrialize uh, before uh, uh, trying to modernize the agriculture. Their disincentive effects of the biases dry up the growth of specific farm output, of total farm product, and of marketed surpluses from agriculture, the various springs of industrializations. So it recalls that um, industrializations. Uh, always follows a growth in agricultural productivity. And he says that in Africa, for example, the investment in agriculture is about uh, 10 or 20 percent of the total investment, while uh, agriculture is more like 35, 40 percent of uh, the GDP in these countries. And he thinks that the share of investment going to agriculture should match their GDP share. Uh, the, the second uh, Nobel Prize of this era, Theodor Schulz for Development Economics, also denounced um, this urban bias in the form of uh, food price controls. So in various countries, uh, food prices are kept low, which is detrimental to uh, farmers and beneficial to the urban population. And he thinks that it distorts uh, the, the, the income, the, the prices, and um, prevents agriculture from uh, developing uh, its, its uh, potential to uh, cont contribution. Schultz uh, is also famous for something else, for the theory of human capital. He's the one who came up with that, uh, that education should be counted as an investment and not uh, as a spending. And, uh, and then uh, he and others developed uh, uh, ways to compute the returns to education, which is seen as a, an investment in, a, in an asset like any other assets. It is called the Minzer equation. And uh, generally, the result is that uh, the returns to education are higher than uh, the returns to other kinds of assets. And this uh, human capital can explain the solos residual. I don't know if you remember, but it, is, it was this unexplained uh, uh, growth in productivity, uh, unexplained by capital and labor, can be explained by human capital's level of skills. Okay, let me go very briefly on the next uh, two or three slides because I want to talk about uh, air cities and I'm lacking time. Uh, so there are big theories of development in the 50s, 60s, to which uh, Hirschman contributed uh, by a theory of unbalanced growth, that uh, you should let some sectors uh, take the lead um, um, and, uh, and this will uh, push the other sectors uh, to develop rapidly. Um, so there, there were debates and, and Hirschman is also known for other works uh, exit voice loyalty, which are the three reactions that one can have to failures in one's organization and analyze the rhetoric of, uh, of reaction of conservatism. Said so that uh, conservative uh, arguments uh, are generally uh, always follow always the same structure. Um, then there are some researchers that are known for their study of uh, developmental state. 
uh, like Alice Amstel and Hai Chung Chang. So they studied the late industrialization. So countries who industrialized uh, lately, like uh, South Korea or Japan to a lesser extent. So these countries relied on, um, and then China, of course. These countries uh, relied on uh, learning, copying from uh, what has been done elsewhere, rather than innovation. And uh, in these countries, intervention from the state was pervasive. Industrial policies helped uh, sectors through various policies, like tariffs, subsidies, investment, education, planning of uh, manpower. Banks were publicly owned uh, in uh, South Korea and uh, targeted credits to uh, the industries that the government wanted to develop in priority. Um, it uh, used financial repression, meaning that uh, rate of interest were maintained low to spur uh, investment and um, and avoid uh, uh, just to spur to spur investment and and help uh, profit. Then Alice Amsen said that uh, these uh, interventions of the state. Um, distorted the price system. And so the resulting prices were wrong. But uh, she says it was actually helpful um, because um, the strategy was uh, smart and, uh, and, um, and it helped uh, firms um, that were helped uh, to become competitive. So, Countries like South Korea proceeded in two times. First, with import substitution, the idea is to try to replace uh, things that uh, you cannot produce yourself, uh, like textiles, by industrializing and, uh, and have light industry do this. And um, so light industry in the sense that it doesn't require a lot of, uh, of capital or of, uh, of high skills. And then in a second time, once you have kind of built uh, some industrial base, um, you promote exports um, through heavy industry. In South Korea, it's, uh, for example, uh, the shipbuilding. And uh, you promote uh, exports um, with industrial policies that uh, that helps these sectors to become a leader in these sectors and to become competitive in the world uh, market. And then as you start exporting, uh, you have a currency that enter and uh, you can buy more capital, etc. All this characterizes a developmental state. So the, the goal of the state is industrialization. Uh, in Chang argues that uh, Western countries have kicked away the ladder uh, on which they had climbed. Uh, they have kicked the ladder uh, away so that uh, low-income countries cannot climb it anymore. Uh, in the sense that with uh, different um, policies and the ideologies that were spread, um, they tried to prevent um, low-income countries, middle-income countries to apply the same kind of interventions through which they developed. Chang shows that uh, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, Western countries used uh, the same kind of intervention as uh, Japan. Uh, Japan has been copied by South Korea, by China. Um, and um, this, uh, in particular, was infant industry promotion that I've already uh, explained a bit. Uh, the idea that uh, you protect uh, some uh, industry that is in its infancy, that is still uncompetitive compared to uh, the global market. Uh, you protect it, uh, for, so meaning that, for example, with high tariffs, um, you make uh, imports uncompetitive in this industry so that you reserve uh, your domestic market to uh, domestic firms. 
this helps them learn, uh, learning by doing, they, they, they become more and more uh, competitive. And when they reach the technological frontier, then you don't need to protect them anymore. And uh, you can remove tariffs, you can uh, remove any kind of uh, pro promotion of exports from the state, of infant industry promotion. And then you try kicking away the ladder and telling other countries that uh, they should abolish tariffs. This is what the UK did in the, in the 19th century. UK um, became a free, free trader against tariff in 1846, when they had uh, secured a very high productivity industry. And, um, and then it provides evidence that the colonizers imposed uh, low tariffs through unequal treaties to China, to Japan, preventing their colonies to having uh, an industry. And it shows that uh, less fair countries like France uh, developed more slowly than developmental states, like uh, Germany, for example. And um, yes. Um, it's not only about uh, tariffs, it's also about uh, foreign technology acquisition, uh, both by buying and by stealing, uh, including spying, export subsidies, investment and manpower planning. Uh, Western countries have used uh, these techniques in the past, and now they're trying to prevent uh, middle income countries to use them. Um, I'm going to, to skip, I think, uh, the critique of uh, globalization. Um, and have a look uh, at it if you want. And I'm going to talk about um, empirical work, but I can take questions before. Yes? Um, why does development in the industrialized sector can any country be, become very developed by, for example, agriculture sector or other sectors? Sorry, can you repeat louder? Okay. Why does development in the industrialized sector become stronger, but not other sectors? Um, it's it's um, usually um, uh, something that is important is uh, uh, your trade balance. So whether you can uh, buy goods that you cannot produce yourself, uh, in other countries. And for that, you need trade. Uh, you need to export things. So, mm, and, and, and the, 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 the goods that pro provide the better, the best terms of trade are uh, very transformed goods, uh, technological uh, goods. So if you export raw material or agricultural products, you will have bad terms of trade uh, because um, because uh, the the wages are, are low in these sectors because uh, because there is an excess labor supply uh, in this sector at the global level and in his, historically this is how uh, development uh, has has, has uh, proceeded. First, uh, gains in uh, agricultural productivity that uh, free up uh, manpower um, uh, and, and food and uh, resources uh, for industrialization, then industrialization and uh, more and more complex uh, industries and you know, manufacturers. And so, and and even in, uh, in, in Western countries uh, that are uh, where, where industry is, is only, I don't know, 20% share of the GDP, where most of the uh, activity is in services, uh, it's, uh, they, they still have um, a competitive advantage in, uh, in some uh, advanced technologies, uh, like in the pharmaceutical industry in Switzerland, uh, in France, it's uh, aviation or uh, luxury uh, goods, uh, things like that. Why is trade, why is good terms of trade needed for development? 
we are good in terms of trade needed because uh, when you lag behind uh, in the stages of development, you need uh, technologies, uh, skills, capital uh, that are in uh, richer countries. You need to, 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 to bring them to your country. Uh, and for that, you need to, to, to buy them, you need to, to sell something. So, yeah. So with the credibility revolution, um, economists uh, starting, started to require um, more convincing uh, proofs uh, of, uh, of the, the hypothesis in the models. And, um, and the main method uh, now used for causal inference in development economics is randomized controlled trials, the same as in medicine. The idea is very simple, and this is why it's very convincing. You assign what's called the treatment, which is generally a policy intervention, to a random uh, sample uh, and to, uh, let's say, a random half, and to a random half of the sample, the control group, you do nothing. And then, you measure the outcome you're interested in, and the difference in the average outcome between the treated and the control group is an unbiased et estimate of uh, the average treatment effect you're interested in. It's very simple econometrics, and it's a very convincing estimate uh, of the effect of your treatment. It is used to uh, find what works in terms of policy intervention. For example, we can, so there is an issue in low-income countries that uh, many uh, pupils uh, at school, they don't go to schools, there is high uh, absenteeism. The question was, uh, how can we um, uh, push them to school, uh, bring them to school at the lowest cost? So different things were tried like uh, hiring an extra teacher, uh, providing more textbooks, and uh, including uh, in the meal, in the midday meal, uh, some medicine that uh, would kill the intestinal worms. And it turned out that this is the, this last uh, option that is the most efficient, and uh, in the sense that uh, it, has the, the, it is the cheapest way to bring an additional child year to school. Actually, uh, many children didn't go to school because uh, in the playground they were playing barefoot and, uh, and, and so the, the parasite they transmit uh, through the, the skin and uh, I don't know uh, how exactly. Um, yeah, because they probably defecate in the same place and then they touch uh, uh, their hands anyway, and then uh, they got sick. They, they, the families noticed that they got sick when they go to school, and uh, so they, they stopped sending their kids to school. And uh, but deworming is very efficient because uh, so the, the it, it helps the, the the health of of kids. I mean, some kids die of this of diarrhea due to what? And uh, and if they are sick, they cannot study properly. Uh, they, they cannot concentrate. There are um, various works uh, that are conducted by RCTs. I'm going to, to give some examples. Um, like, um, yeah, in the same topic, another method would be to uh, give cash to the families when their kids go to school or if their kids go to school. It works, but it's uh, $60 per uh, child year for extra child year of schooling, so it's more expensive, but it shares other purposes, of course, because it's also uh, a way to reduce uh, poverty of the families. So, so even if it's uh, not as efficient to, to reduce school absenteeism, it can still be uh, a good policy. Then uh, we can also give cash to, to households without any condition. And uh, it has been shown that unconditional cash transfers improve living condition, surprise, surprise, and also that it outperforms food distribution. So people 
um, are better fed when you give them cash than if you give them food directly. Because uh, someday they actually don't need food, they need uh, medicine. Uh, one big issue with uh, randomized control trials is whether uh, they are externally valid, whether uh, the effects that we find in some place uh, would be the same in another place. And um, to know this, we need replication of the study in different places. Um, and we need some theory to understand um, why would uh, the result be the same or be different, in what ways, depending on the characteristics of uh, the different contexts. Another issue is that university is costly, and it is justified only when we don't have prior knowledge about the topic. I'm going to take a controversial example. Do we need an RCT for mRNA vaccine against the Delta or Omicron variant? So I don't know about this topic, but imagine that uh, the science of mRNA vaccine is very well known and that uh, we have already seen with an RCT that uh, there is no um, uh, concerning side effects of the vaccine against the alpha variant. And uh, we know that uh, there is just some little thing to change in the vaccine to, to make it work against the Delta variant. And that uh, we know by the theory that uh, will not affect uh, side effects. And uh, in this case, requiring an RCT before approving the new vaccine uh, will delay uh, the arrival in the new vaccine. And so uh, will uh, imply uh, more death. So, because uh, we, I mean, in this case, I'm not sure it's valid the, the example I give, but imagine uh, then because we have uh, some scientific knowledge, um, uh, RCT is the good thing to do only if uh, you face a skeptical audience that you try to convince. Uh, because then, I mean, you, it's, it's, uh, you cannot argue against an RCT, it's very clear cut unless you, you don't trust the, the data itself. Um, but um, it prevents uh, knowledge, uh, okay? Because you do as if you didn't know anything about the thing you are studying. Uh, so, so forgetting about uh, previous knowledge is not the, the way science should proceed. Um, and this is why RCTs are bad they are put to best use when they serve uh, theories, when they are linked to theories, when they serve informing, testing, or calibrating theories. Then we don't answer only what works, but why it works. Uh, the idea here is that, uh, okay, let me give an example. Uh, actually, the, the second example. Imagine we, we find that uh, by um, giving uh, training to uh, some uh, unemployed people, uh, they have more chances to find a job. Uh, so uh, the naive uh, uh, result, the interpretation is that uh, we should uh, uh, give training to everyone because uh, uh, people uh, learn skills and, uh, and so they become more employable. But if you take into account general equilibrium effects, uh, maybe if you give training to everyone, uh, it won't have any effect. Because the reason why uh, it had an effect in the first place is because uh, there was a competition between employed and those uh, who had the training uh, were better than the others. But um, the number of uh, vacancies uh, do not change, uh, may not change uh, if, you, uh, if you train the, the population better. And so uh, it's a zero sum game. Uh, the same idea can, can be applied to the returns to education. So um, the, the, the good approach would be to embed. Uh, to, to inform a theory using RCT results. And your theory would include a general equilibrium effect, and you could calibrate your theory using uh, RCTs. And, um, and then you could take uh, these effects into account. 
I want to give um, another example where our cities uh, have been uh, linked to theory for the better. There was a controversial hypothesis in development economics, that of poverty traps. The idea that um, if we could uh, give some uh, capital uh, to very poor people, uh, they would uh, uh, be lifted up uh, above poverty, out of poverty, uh, and they will uh, in a self-sustained way, so that uh, after some years, they will have enough, uh, enough uh, income to pay back uh, the, the, the capital that you gave them. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, when, when we observe in, uh, in some countries like Bangladesh, it's a bimodal distribution of income in, in rural villages. So uh, if uh, income is here, uh, you have a lot of people that have very, very low zero uh, assets and some that have some assets and nothing here. So uh, one reason could be a poverty trap. Uh, these people, they, they, they don't have uh, enough income, enough wealth to be able to save. They are uh, always on the edge of, uh, of starving. So, um, so they, they cannot... Uh, uh, save, but but when they they, they are uh, on the good side of the threshold, they can accumulate some capital and end up here. The alternative explanation is that there are some innate factors that some people are lazy or unproductive, and uh, there is nothing to do about it. They will remain here, and the productive one they are here. Um, so Balboni and uh, her co-authors. Uh, recently published a paper where they gave a call, which is a large asset in Bangladesh. It's $500, which is a lot for uh, these people, um, as well as temporary training and income support. And they show that it permanently lifts people out of extreme poverty. Their income grew from uh, $50 per month to a uh, permanent $100 per month after the intervention. And um, they, so this is just the, the RCT result, okay, uh, giving them a co uh, help them um, permanently. And uh, it was used to uh, answer the theory question of the existence of poverty trap and to prove that they exist, at least in this uh, Bangladesh context. They computed the uh, transition equation. So on the abscess is the asset before uh, the their transfer of the cow in the treated villages. And on the y-axis is the level of, of wealth a few years later. Uh, it's uh, in thousand uh, takas, the Bangladeshi uh, currency. And you see that uh, we, we found again this uh, bimodal distribution after some years. There are uh, many people here at this level of ascent, 2.1, and uh, many people here around uh, 2.7. And not many people uh, here, because people above the threshold, uh, they, conver they are converging to, to this stable equilibrium in terms of wealth. People below the threshold, they are converging to this uh, lower equilibrium, stable equilibrium. And there, there is the threshold and st stable uh, so, so yes, so this proved the, the, the existence of property trapped, and, uh, and this policy is, uh, is something we should consider providing uh, uh, an asset uh, to, uh, to many people in rural areas. Just a critical look at this, at this paper. Um, even though it's, it's very well empirically uh, proven, etc., uh, do we learn something that we didn't know from the theory, the macro theory of the past? Lipton, he uh, insisted on land reform. And land reform, it's giving capital, giving wealth to the poorest. And actually giving a piece of land uh, is more than giving a cow. So maybe there is a regression in the level of ambition from giving uh, a plot of land that is worth more a cow than just giving a cow. I mean, I'm exaggerating because probably the, the researchers of uh, this paper, they, they would agree with that. And, uh, and it's just that they don't have the resource, uh, the possibility to, to, to design a small uh, land reform in an experimental setting. Um, 
Yes, so I'm arriving at the end of the class. Uh, I don't have time to, to mention other issues of RCTs, and I don't have time to talk about this last night about uh, feminist economics, because uh, uh, women are often the, the poorest, um, and um, for example, there is this Leontief Prize, Bina Agarval, that uh, not only contributed to economics, but also uh, was successful in uh, introducing, uh, in, in, uh, I mean, she led a political movement that uh, obtained uh, a law, a legislation in India that gave uh, all Hindu women, because people don't have the same rights uh, according to religion in India, uh, gave Hindu women equal rights with men in the ownership uh, and inheritance of agricultural land. And this is uh, one key aspect on how to uh, help um, gender equality and uh, development uh, a posterior, a posterior. So thank you very much. I hope uh, you enjoyed the class. For me, I enjoyed it a lot. And don't hesitate if you have any questions.